Chapter 18 Megan was never so glad to get off of anything in her entire life. The horse's jarring movements made her legs sore and her teeth hurt from clenching them every time she thought she was going to fall off. Shaking, she stepped away from the animal and took a deep breath of fresh air to calm her nerves. For as long as she lived, she vowed to never get on a horse ever again. Buddy, who had led them to this point, panted as he made his way to a row of trees that lined an abandoned property. Blake tied the horse to a tree before he approached her and spoke, keeping his voice low. Ted must be in that direction. I'd say it's a sure bet that Cole is with him. She looked at the shelter belt. Do you think Cole hurt Ted? I don't know. It's hard to say what frame of mind Cole is in. I don't think he'd hurt anyone, but then again, I didn't think he'd steal either. She didn't like the sound of that. Pressing her hand to her stomach, she forced the nausea aside. she just found Ted and didn't want to live the rest of her life without him. Then she remembered the brochure. Of course Ted was alive and well. She and Ted were supposed to have three children together. That meant whatever happened tonight, it would turn out all right. Feeling as if a huge weight was off of her shoulders, she proceeded forward. Don't be hasty, Blake warned, grabbing her arm. We need to be careful. I'm going to be fine. Just worry about yourself. She ran after the dog, her shoes quiet on the grass. She stopped at the evergreen trees and watched as Buddy slip between them, but decided that she wasn't going to go that route. Instead, she traveled the length of the shelter belt and paused when she reached the end. She glanced over her shoulder and saw that Blake was jogging after her. While she waited for him to catch up to her, she peeked around the tree and frowned. Through the window of the abandoned cabin, she saw Charles waving something. What was Charles doing here? When she saw that Charles had a gun, she gasped. She turned to Blake and reached for his shirt sleeve. We have to help them. Charles turned in their direction. She ducked behind the trees. Blake shook his head. That was close. We have to be careful. He might not kill you, but he can shoot you in the arm or leg. That was a sobering thought. The brochure hadn't said whether or not she'd been crippled. That was it. She was going to play it safe. Crouching, she snuck over to the cabin, Blake at her heels. The dog sat by the door, quiet but alert. How did Buddy know to keep quiet? Blake knelt next to her and pulled out his gun. He opened the chamber and rolled his eyes when he saw there were no bullets. He dug into his pocket and pulled out a couple of bullets. No, Charles, I'm not giving you this device. It'd be much too dangerous if it got into the wrong hands. That's cool, Blake mouthed to her as he put the bullets in. She nodded. I didn't ask if it was a good idea, did I? I ordered you to hand it over, or you'll be making a trip to meet your maker, Charles said. Be reasonable, Ted replied in a soothing voice. This is a worthless piece of junk. It's not worth going to jail over. Charles laughed. I won't be going to jail because I'm not going to get caught. Blake motioned to her that the gun was ready, so she moved aside and let him creep to the edge of the doorway. She held her breath. I can't let you have it, Cole said, his tone firm. Are you willing to die for it? Charles asked, amused. Megan heard a click and knew that Charles was ready to shoot. Why wasn't Blake going into the cabin and rescuing Ted and Cole? She shot him an impatient look, but he held his hand up to her as a signal to wait. Gritting her teeth, she eased up and peered through the broken window. Ted and Cole had their hands up, and Cole was holding something in his hand. She guessed it was the time machine. A glance in Blake's direction notified her of the problem. He didn't have a clear view of Charles from where he stood. Well, she could take care of that. She bent down and picked up a rock. She estimated how much force she would have to use to throw the rock in Charles's direction. And then she threw it. The rock landed on the back of his head. Hey! Charles screamed and turned the gun in her direction. She ducked just in time to avoid being shot at. The sound of the bullet rang in her ears. Blake rushed into the cabin. Hands up! Buddy ran in after him and barked. 
Another gunshot went off, prompting her to make a mad dash into the cabin as well. Sure, it was stupid. She wasn't armed, and she didn't know if Charles still had a gun or not. But all she could think of was Ted, and that Charles might have shot him. Blake was on the floor, face down and unconscious. She wasn't sure, but it looked as if there was some blood pooling beneath him. Ted struggled with Charles to get control of the gun, and another shot rang through the air as Charles shot the floorboard. Cole ran over to Blake and turned him over, calling out his name. This was up to her. She had to help her husband. She yelled out and jumped on Charles's back. She beat him on the head and shoulders. Let go of the gun, you creep! Charles stumbled backward. Ted lost his hold on the gun, and Charles spun around. Screaming, she clung to him and inadvertently covered his eyes. He flung his arms and shot again. This time the bullet struck the window and the remaining glass shattered into a million pieces. Ted reached out and grabbed for the gun again, but he missed. Raise! Don't anybody move! Someone called out. Charles swung again and nearly shot Aaron, who dropped to the floor in time to dodge the bullet. Cole leapt up and grabbed Charles's wrist, while Ted snatched the gun out of his grasp. Aaron jumped back up, rushed over towards Charles. Get off of him! he ordered. She obeyed and fell to the floor with a thud. She winced and rubbed her back. Aaron pointed the gun at Charles, who was panting. That's enough, Charles! He gasped for air. I thought there was something suspicious going on when Blake came to talk to me. Now I know I was wise to follow him out here. He glanced around at everyone in the cabin. I think you all have a lot of explaining to do. Sunrise came up by the time Ted and Cole finished explaining everything to the marshal in the jailhouse. Charles was confined to a cell, so he wasn't privy to the sensitive information the two men told Aaron, who sat back and listened to everything with keen interest. I thought there was something odd about you, Aaron told Ted. Now I know why. Ted shrugged, unwilling to let the marshal know that, even now, he could intimidate him. He supposed he would have to get used to this, since he was going to spend the rest of his life here. It's not like I could come up and tell you everything that happened, Ted said. Aaron turned the time travel device over in his hands. Naturally, I don't understand how this thing works. He raised an eyebrow and looked at Cole. I don't have any desire to understand it either. He handed the device to Cole. Then he turned his attention to Ted. So, will you and Megan be staying or going? Ted blinked in surprise. You mean you're not going to arrest us again? Why? You didn't do anything wrong, Aaron said. Charles is the one who threatened to kill people. He'll be stuck in jail. Cole inched forward in his chair. What if he tells people about time travel? It's not a good idea for information to get into the wrong hands, Cole said. Aaron laughed. Let him. No one's going to believe him. It'll just look like he made it all up. And then he'll be a fool. And if there's one thing Charles Nichols can't stand, it's looking like a fool. You don't have to worry about me either. I won't say a word. As far as I'm concerned, Charles saw that you had gold and got greedy for more. Well, thank you, Marshal, Cole said. Ted joined Cole and Aaron in standing up. After Aaron shook Cole's hand, he turned to shake Ted's hand. I still don't know about you, though. Ted felt a flicker of irritation before Aaron winked. Then Ted chuckled. Well, maybe one of these days you'll figure me out, Ted replied. Megan paced the hospital room, looked out the window, and huffed. Esther, who sat beside Blake, who slept in a hospital bed, shook her head and closed her Bible. I don't understand why you keep looking out there. The men will come when they're ready. Megan turned and faced Esther. I was there. I was a witness to the events. But your husband doesn't even care about that. It's nothing personal. The men were there too, and their testimonies were all in our needs. Megan crossed her arms. I don't like it. I should be there. You were the only woman there, and you managed to cause enough of a ruckus so that Charles didn't kill anyone. That's quite an accomplishment. Can't you be satisfied with that? I, I do suppose I was the bravest one there, Megan said. I'm sure you were. I didn't have a weapon to defend myself. It's not like I have the strength that a man does. 
Yes, that's very true. Megan glanced at Esther, wondering if the woman was humoring her, but Esther's face remained expressionless, giving Megan no true indicator as to how she really felt. Giving up her vigil at the window, Megan sat next to her friend. I guess I'm just going to have to get used to it. Women are excluded from certain things. Smiling, Esther patted her hand. I know that wherever it is you came from, women were allowed more of a say. But is it really that bad in Fargo? She thought over Esther's inquiry. No, it's not. Especially when I have a husband who loves me as much as Ted does. There you go. Maybe it's not where you are, but who you're with that makes all the difference. Megan reached out and squeezed Esther's hand. You're right. Blake groaned. Megan leaned forward. Blake? His eyes slowly opened. I'm not dead? No. The doctor said the bullet went right through your shoulder. You're going to be just fine. But you need to rest up for a few days before you can leave. The doctor needs to make sure you don't come down with an infection. He closed his eyes. Okay. It's good to see that you're awake. Esther stood up. I'll get the nurse. Once Esther left the room, Megan whispered, Cole has the time machine, but he said he's going to return it to you. You can return it to the correct time as soon as you're well enough to leave. He opened his eyes again and smiled. Good. I had hoped that he would do the right thing in the end. Two weeks later, Blake, Cole, Megan, and Ted stood in an alley close to this train station. Are you sure you don't want to go back? Blake asked Cole. Cole tipped his hat back. I'm sure. There's nothing waiting for me back there. But I might have something waiting for me here. If I don't find out, I'll always regret it. What do you want me to tell the police? Blake asked. Cole shrugged. Tell them I'm no longer alive. By the time you get back to the future, it'll be the truth. All right. I'll do that. Blake shook Cole's hand. Good luck. Then he looked at Ted and Megan. And you two are sure you want to stay here, too? Yes. We're meant to be here. Megan caressed the folded letter in her hand. She had debated whether or not to make the request, and as much as she hated to interfere with time, she hated to leave her mother worrying about her. Taking a deep breath, she held out the letter. Will you give this to my mother? Her name is Veronica Crane. She'll be at the Amtrak station in Indianapolis on April 22nd at 6.30 in the morning. That's when I boarded the train. She has blonde hair and will be wearing a green sweater with black slacks. Yes, I'll give her the letter, Blake promised. Then he took it. It's just as well that I start there and come off the train in Minneapolis. I just have to make sure I don't bump into myself. He programmed the device and disappeared. The three stood still, silent for a moment, before they turned and left the alley. It was weird to know Blake had just traveled into the future in that split second, and Megan realized but by the time her mother got that letter, he would be over a hundred years old. Cole smiled at them. Well, I need to catch a train. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Megan. They nodded and watched as he made his way down the busy street to the train station. Next to her, Ted extended his arm to her. Ready to go home? She slipped her hand around the crook of his arm. Yes. Let's go home. Three days later, Cole's heart raced as he pulled back the reins of the horse that he had bought while in town. He had sold his ring, something that he was glad to do. He might as well put the past behind him. But he did wonder if he had a future here. He spent the past week and a half planning what he'd tell Penelope. He took his time in getting down from the horse. How could he explain everything to her? Would she even listen? He tied the reins to the post in front of the small barn on her property. Once again, he ran through a list of possible things he could tell her. But would she listen? 
She had every right to slam the door in his face and demand he return to town. He looked at her cabin. Her door was open because of the hot weather. She didn't even have a screen door to protect her from the mosquitoes. That was something he would have to rectify if she allowed him back into her life. He strengthened his resolve. He'd go up to her and beg her to take him back. What did he have to lose? She came out of the house wearing male gloves and a hat. He'd been with her long enough to know that she wore those gloves to weed the garden. He watched her for a moment. She was beautiful. The prairie winds loosened several strands of her hair and made her skirt flap wildly, just as wildly as his heart was beating. Her eyes met his, and she stood still. It was now or never. He'd come too far to turn back now. He lumbered forward, his steps uncertain, but propelling him to her. Taking his hat off, he tried to gauge the reaction on her face. He couldn't tell if she was happy or not. He stood a foot in front of her, too nervous to get any closer. I'm sorry, he began, his hands trembling. I shouldn't have left you. I love you, Penelope. I don't deserve you. You're a good woman, but I've made a real mess of my life. I've done things I'm not proud of, and after I tell you what they are, you may not even want to be with me. You see, I... Are you married? She interrupted. The question surprised him. No. I thought when you left me, it was because you were already married. I thought you had a wife to go back to. No. I was married, but I got a divorce two years ago. I caught her sleeping with my brother. But there are other things. Things you should know. She stepped forward, bridging the gap between them. Cole, I don't care what you've done. I just care about who you are. The past doesn't matter. You can't change it. He hadn't expected this. He'd hoped. He'd prayed. He'd wished but he hadn't expected her only concern to be his marital status. Despite his efforts not to cry, he felt a tear trickle down his cheek. Smiling, she reached up and brushed it away. He took her hand in his and kissed it. I love you. I want to make a life here with you. Will you come to town with me? We'll leave right away and find that preacher you mentioned. She laughed. I'll marry you, Cole. But we should have something to eat first. Then we need to get ready for the trip. All right, but let's be quick about it. I've waited too long to meet someone like you, and I don't want to waste any more time. October 4th, 1899. Megan held five-month-old Pole in her arms. She sat in a chair on the porch and watched the sunset. The diamond on her wedding ring sparkled in the remaining sunlight. She smiled. Sure, the diamond wasn't as big as the one Buddy had swallowed, but she liked it much more because Ted had given it to her. A horse neighed, breaking her out of her thoughts. She pointed to Ted as he waved to her and rode his horse to the barn. Your father's home, see? The baby, of course, just grunted and went back to sleep. She chuckled. When he got older, he'd be running out to welcome his paw home. Megan? A familiar voice called out. Curious, she stood up and walked the length of the porch until she came to the front door. Her heart skipped a beat. Mom? Beside her mother stood Blake. Still holding Paul, Megan embraced her mother, letting the tears fall down her cheeks. Blake smiled at them and walked down the porch steps to give them privacy. I didn't think I was ever going to see you again, Megan whispered. Her mother returned her hug, also crying. My dear Meg, I've missed you. Reluctant, Megan pulled away. Did you get my letter from Blake? I did, her mother said. I just said goodbye to you and you went on the train when he came to me. It's been five years since that morning. I'm only allowed to stay here for a few minutes, and I can't come see you again. Though we know of time travel, we aren't supposed to interfere with people living in the past. 
We are to be observers only. And to be honest, I wouldn't have been able to afford the trip. But Blake talked to Christian Jacob. He explained who you were, and after Christian went and searched further back into his genealogy, he allowed Blake to bring me here. She laughed. I guess being the mother of his great-great-grandmother means I have a special privileges. Well, if it weren't for us, he wouldn't have been born, Megan replied. Glad to see you. I'm glad to see you, too. I wanted to come and ask how things are. I see that you got the child you wanted. Yes, and I got a good husband, too. Megan handed Paul to her mother. I know Ted isn't like Mike, but he treats me very well. That's all I've ever wanted for you, her mother said. I'm glad to see that you're happy. And I admit, I chose this time to come because I knew you just had your first child. I also wanted to see you in person. Pictures are fine, of course, but they aren't as good as the real thing. Megan frowned. Pictures? Yes. She reached into her pocket and handed Megan a photograph. It was faded with time, but Megan could tell who was in the picture. Ted stood behind her. She was sitting in a chair holding a baby, and two boys sat at her feet. It was taken in 1903, her mother said. I keep it on my nightstand in a frame. I wanted to show it to you so you know what your future looks like. Megan laughed and wiped her eyes. She was thrilled, but for some reason she couldn't stop crying. It's strange to know all of this is going to happen. That's the irony of going back in time, I guess, her mother said. Megan gave the picture back to her and said to the joy in her mother's eyes. What's your life like? I remarried a year ago. Did you? Who is he? Megan asked. His name is Aidan Landon. He's Blake's brother. Guess you introduced us, her mother said. Megan laughed again. Is he good to you? Yes, her mother said. I missed your father after he passed away. He hasn't taken your father's place, but I love him just as much. Good. Megan had feared her mother would have to spend the rest of her life alone, and now that she knew her mother had someone to care for her, she felt at peace with being separated from her. I think of you a lot. I think of you, too. You'll always be my little girl, her mom said. Megan glanced over her shoulder and saw Ted making his way toward them. I want you to meet Ted. When he reached them, Megan introduced him to her mother. After a couple of minutes, Blake came up to tell her mother that they had to return to the future. Megan hugged her mother one last time before her mother handed Paul back to her and went over to Blake. Thank you, Blake, Megan said. Blake smiled. It's the least I could do for the woman who saved my life. They waved, and Megan and Ted waved back. Once they disappeared, Megan turned to Ted. She could only come once, and she wanted to see Paul. She knew how much I wanted a child. I'm glad you got the chance to see her again, Ted replied. It was nice to meet her. I think she approved of you. I hope so, Ted said. That sure was nice to see that picture of us, wasn't it? Nice, Megan agreed, but kind of spooky. I don't think I want to know everything that's going to happen. He leaned over to kiss her. Well, it seems to me that Paul has a couple of younger brothers coming. We should probably start on getting them conceived. She hid her amusement. My mother just came for a visit, and all you can think about is sex? Sex? Is that what you think this is all about? For your information, I'm thinking of the future. We have to do our part to make sure Paul gets those brothers. This is serious business. How is that picture taken in 1903 ever going to happen if we don't get those kids born? We can't mess with what's meant to be. I'll tell you what, she said. You get supper done, then we'll talk about making sure things happen as they're supposed to. It's a deal. She watched as he ran into the house to start supper. She glanced at Paul, who babbled at her. You're right. He does have a strange way of rationalizing things. But 
At least he cooks. I guess the least I can do is humor him. Besides, I kind of like his cobbler. Paul giggled, and she kissed him on the head, before she entered the house to join Ted in the kitchen. Though Ted hadn't peeked on the other side of that photograph, she had. And one of the things she'd seen were the names and birthdays of the children. Ted had a very good chance of reaching his goal that night. After all, Anthony was supposed to be born on July 27, 1900. That was approximately nine months from now. And who was she to interfere with the past? If it was meant to be, it was meant to be.